my name is Elizabeth Boyle. I'm a research fellow at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm joined on my panel here with Albert Fenton, who is a graduate of the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic at the University of Cambridge uh, Trinity College, who is at the moment a kind of web copywriter. He's done a master's degree here in London at UCL and is hoping to start a PhD on medieval history uh, very shortly. On my right here is Dr. Levi Roach. He's a lecturer in medieval history at the University of Exeter, specialising particularly in Anglo-Saxon and uh, German medieval history, uh, amongst other things, and bridged only by a chair. Not, this is not a metaphor for an intellectual divide, is uh, the wonderful Lindsay Johns, uh, who is a blogger for the Daily Mail, amongst other sites, and is also a hip-hop intellectual. They know more because I hear that hip-hop is dead. <laughs> Rest in peace. But anyway... All I wanted to say was to open up a few possibilities for discussion, really. I was going to start off by saying that uh, I think in the second half of the 20th century and these first decades of the 21st, there have been very rapid advances in the study of medieval history. And that's particularly the case, I think, for kind of cultural and intellectual and economic history of the Middle Ages. But my feeling might be wrong, and I'd be happy to correct, be corrected on this, is that uh, very little of these advances have actually really trickled down into the wider general public. And I just wanted to think a little bit about why that might be the case. My feeling is that in British primary schools, particularly, children might study, for example, the Anglo-Saxons or the Vikings, and often with great enthusiasm, but then enter secondary school, and they go on to do grown-up history. And grown-up history is the rise of Nazism and the Second World War and the history of the Soviet Union and so on. And these things are, of course, very important recent phenomena. But my feeling is that there's um, something... There's an implication that there's something childish and unsophisticated uh, or simplistic about medieval history. Uh, and to my mind, nothing could be further from the truth. And so the meat of the Middle Ages, which I think are the kind of political transformations, the creative achievements, the scholarship, the poetry, the art, uh, I think the cultural clashes and the cultural accommodations are largely unknown to most people. And does it matter that this is the case? I think it matters that Celtic crosses and runic inscriptions have been adopted as the imagery of choice for white supremacists. I think it matters that the British National Party uh, can talk about traditional British culture, or English Defence League can, can talk about indigenous English culture, a contradiction in terms, surely historically speaking, without ever identifying or defining what those things are. To my mind, the Anglo-Saxon, Celtic and Scandinavian cultures of early medieval Britain could perhaps be invoked less easily, invidious and divisive and hateful things, uh, if people were better informed about the nature of historical immigration, for example, and cultural change. My point, perhaps, obviously being that the past belongs to everybody and not particular political groups. But then should the teaching of medieval history simply be about our island story, when arguably the most interesting kind of political, intellectual and economic developments in the Middle Ages were taking place under the Muslim Caliphates and the Carolingian Empire. So where do we begin and end chronologically and geographically? Something worth thinking about. As with history, so with literature. Uh, Chaucer just about clings on to the A-level syllabus, but he's the only medieval author who does. I think the wonders of old English literature, for example, don't really get a look in, and have even disappeared from degree level study of English literature, increasingly so. But then again, why limit things to the Anglophone world? Um, some of the most enduring literature of the Middle Ages was written in early medieval Ireland or late medieval France. People aren't really exposed to those things. But, but just, despite my gloomy feelings about the infantilizing and meagre coverage of the Middle Ages uh, in schools, I think that medieval culture is the subject of enormous interest to the wider public. Uh, and one only has to think, for example, of the hundreds of thousands of people who queued to see the Staffordshire Horde, or the great audiences that we have for TV documentaries, whatever their merits, you might want to talk about that, about medieval culture. As Greg Wolfe wrote recently in relation to Roman history, and I quote, 
Neither the general public nor school and university students have lost that sense of excitement in piecing together a great movement through history that has left so many traces in the world we inhabit today. I think the same is true of the Middle Ages, and I think the task, in a sense, is to bridge the gap between, well, gap, maybe chasm might be a better word, between people's interest and people's knowledge. How do we go about doing that? So when Wolf speaks about the history that's left so many traces in the world we inhabit today, I think those traces can be the starting point for engaging the interest of the wider public uh, and encouraging a more sophisticated engagement, perhaps with the medieval traces in our modern physical and creative landscapes. But the traces of the medieval world, which have not survived into the modern times, are also worthy of study. And uh, in many ways, the Middle Ages were fundamentally different to today in terms of people's world view, in terms of especially perhaps the religiosity of the Middle Ages compared to perhaps to modern Western civilization. And the idea that people are only interested in that which is relevant today, I think, is patronizing and uh, misguided. That being said, we find the roots of many of our uh, cultural and political institutions in the Middle Ages, but that is not the only reason why we should engage with that period and, and that which did not survive to the present and why those things did not survive to the present, I think, in need of consideration. So I think that all history should, of course, be of interest to historians, and I think it's our job to communicate, as historians, our findings to the wider public as best we can. Uh, ignoring certain periods of history, and I think sacrificing them perhaps on the altar of modernity, which seems to be a bit of a, a problem at the moment, will not stop other people from qu inquiring into those periods, uh, but it does, I think, increase the risk that they do so with perhaps particular political motivations in mind, and that's something I'd be interested in kind of um, discussing later. Uh, and I worry about the risk of sort of subordinating history to particular ends. So I think illuminating the Middle Ages is the job of disinterested scholars, and I think everyone should benefit from the resulting light of that kind of illumination. And I think one way that this might be achieved is by dragging the Middle Ages out of childhood, which I think is the way it's currently um, covered in our schools, and making it a serious and kind of adult subject of discussion, which is, I hope is something that we can do this morning. For me, one of the most striking things about the Middle Ages when we look back at this period is the, and I think Lizzie alluded to this, is the really profoundly complex nature of medieval identity. And by that I mean political identity chiefly and social identity. I think we tend to have this kind of prejudice that we think that in the modern period we, we have a very sophisticated understanding of our identity. But I think our medieval forebears had uh, an equally, if not more, sophisticated understanding of their own political and social identity. I was reading a book um, by the uh, ec economist and March Sen recently called Identity and Violence, um, and it really struck a chord with me. And in the book, Sen argues against the idea uh, that human identities are formed chiefly by membership of one single exclusive social group. Um, Sen makes the case that we should be very wary of attempts to define every human being in terms of one single, unchanging, sort of static essence. And in its place, we should, we should see uh, human societies and, and therefore we should see history as more complex, as more nuanced and interconnected. And he argues that in many cases, um, what is often ascribed to one particular culture, in fact, originally arose in another culture. And as individuals, too, Amartya Sen argues that we shouldn't see contradiction in seeing ourselves as belonging to a diverse and sometimes competing range of social, cultural, and political categories. And as someone who studied the Middle Ages at university, Amartya Sen's idea really fascinated me because I think Amartya Sen's right. I think it, when we look at the Middle Ages, we see a multitude of evidence of cultures and identities changing rapidly often quite violently, but we also see human societies attempting to integrate competing models of identity, competing languages, to create new and more complex identities for themselves. And there's a range of evidence to show that medieval people were, for example, profoundly multilingual, more so than, I would argue, 
mo many modern societies because they lived in polities, in, in societies with two, three, sometimes even four competing linguistic or, and cultural influences. I think that is particularly true of the history and politics of Scotland and the north of England, um, from the withdrawal of Roman power in that region to the creation of the medieval kingdom of Scotland. The, this sort of area between Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall became home to six native kingdoms, all with their own culture and unique political structures. And over, over time, the influences from, from different ethnic groups, Britons, Picts, Angles, Scots, Vikings, would gradually give rise to larger and more centralised political structures. And by the 11th century, French settlement began in Scotland and deeply permeated um, Scottish society, both on the elite level and amongst the servant classes. And the sort of Celtic-speaking um, Britonic origins of the Old North now survive only in faint echoes. We've lost the Pictish language. And the names of English counties, counties that we think of as English in their identity, Cumbria, for example. Cumbria, the name, comes from the Welsh word Cymru, meaning countrymen. So that county which we think of as English actually has a Britonic identity originally. And studies have shown that to this day, the counting system employed by Cumbrian shepherds, I think this is fascinating, has its origins in the Britonic language. They still use the Britonic language to count in. Uh, and I think that's fascinating. And that kind of brings me to my second point, which is that studying the Middle Ages reminds us um, of the multitude of lost and forgotten kingdoms and nation states that were that once existed and were then later conquered or later subsumed by the ones which survive today, like England, Scotland, Wales. And I think this is a kind of bias amongst historians, really. Historians like to be able to relate the history they write to modern politics. Um, so we have thousands of books on British history, on French history, on Russian history. Um, but we forget in the process of that, I think, that huge swathes of human experience and chunks of history are left out of our kind of mental maps that we have in our heads when we think about Europe and European identity and what Europe is. So in the process, the independent kingdoms of Strathclyde, of Galloway, of Reged, all these fascinating um, regions and kingdoms which were once autonomous, which once existed in Britain's old north, and which all have unique histories and unique identities uh, shouldn't be overlooked. And one of the important lessons, I think we should be very sceptical when someone says we should draw lessons from history, but one of the lessons I do think we can draw from medieval history is that national identity and language and culture aren't passed down um, from generation to generation as static, unchanging blocks. I think in the Middle Ages, this period of absolute dynamism shows that um, identity is constantly being renegotiated from generation to generation according to political um, and economic conditions of the time. So, for example, look at the development of towns in early medieval Ireland. Um, there's strong evidence to suggest the hinterland of towns like Cork, Waterford and Limerick um, had a mixed early population of Norse and Irish settlers, giving rise to a unique Hiberno-Norse culture. And inscriptions bear witness to a population which was familiar and perhaps fluent in Irish, Norse, Latin and English. So just to conclude, I think the medieval period is fascinating because in one sense it's foreign land uh, and thanks to the lack of evidence for this period, deeply mysterious, but it's a period that was fundamental in shaping our language and creating, whether we like it or not, the national and political identities which have been handed down to us and which survive in the landscape all around us. More profoundly, the period shows that we have to always challenge simplistic um, models and simplistic notions of national identity and political identity wherever we see them in society. I'm not a venerable academic like the rest of this esteemed panel. I'm just an interested layman who many years ago was very fortunate to drink deeply and to attempt to slake my thirst from the well of medieval wisdom. So this morning, for your cerebral delectation, I would like to give you, in chronological order, my very personal top five medieval writers whose works have had a profound and enduring influence on my own life. 
Number one, Boethius. That's right, Anesius Manlius Severinus Boethius, 480 to 524 AD. You heard it here first. Author of the Consolation of Philosophy, otherwise known from here on in as the Consolatio. Composed in prison whilst he was awaiting execution. Boethius has very famously been called the last of the Romans and the first of the scholastics. What was the Consolatio? Well, it was a philosophical and poetic meditation on the big questions in life. I'm talking really big. I'm talking the nature of evil. I'm talking fortune. I'm talking free will, predestination, providence. I'm talking human freedom. I'm also talking the nature of the good life, the summum bonum. In essence, uh, Boethius's Consolatio was a Stoic and Christian Platonic tract which had enduring influence throughout the centuries and impacted massively upon the medieval period. It's a, it's a work which none other than Alfred the Great and Queen Elizabeth I have all translated. For me, it's about the sheer power of this work to engage with life's vicissitudes. People like Brian Keenan and Terry Waite, when they were in captivity in Beirut, referenced and read Boethius's Consolation. It's not just Waiting for Godot, which has been performed in prisons in America, Boethius's consolation was actually read and disseminated amongst uh, inmates in Attica prison. It does have a real tangible power to uplift and, as the title implies, to console. Unfortunately, in 524, on the orders of Theodoric the Ostrogoth, Boethius was strangled and cudgeled to death in a prison cell in Pavia. But apparently, he met his end with equanimity and poise, thanks to the philosophical reflections contained within the Consolatio. So that's number one, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. Number two, they're going to be coming at you thick and fast, the Carmina Burana. Now, many of you will be familiar with Karl Orff's musical composition in which he set uh, to music the Carmina Burana. What is it? It's a collection of medieval Latin poems actually found in a monastery in Bavaria in the 1800s. Why do I like it so much, and why has it had such a profound influence on my life? What is it? It's a collection of satirical, didactic, mock didactic, love songs, and drinking songs. So the key concept here, it's Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, but on acid. All right? It is imbued with scabrous humor. It's imbued with intellectual recalcitrance. And it's imbued with a blithe, goliardic, Insouciance. That's why I love it. Also, it's got a great awareness of life's ephemerality. It's imbued with that wonderful Horatian carpe diem motif. It's raucous, it's bibulous, and it's bawdy. It's about wine and extolling, lyrically extolling, the beauties of wine, women, and song. The poets, Hugh or Walter of Chatillon, the, the, the arch poet, various poets come together in the collection, but they are clearly men after my own heart. The Carmina Burana is at number two. Number three, folks, the year is 2012. I want you to cast your mind back 20 years. It's actually, yes, 20 years since, in that famous scene, Shabba Ranks, the Jamaican reggae artist, was excoriated by Mark Lamar on The Word on Channel 4 for advocating the killing of homosexuals. It is also 20 years since the Jamaican ragga singer Buju Banton famously sung that pernicious, pernicious lyric, Boom Bye Bye, in which he advocated the killing of homosexuals. Now, forgive me, you're probably thinking, what is the correlation, what's the link between Boom Bye Bye, Buju Banton, Shabba Ranks, and the medieval times. Well, I'll tell you, the link is Alan of Lille. Alan of Lille wrote a famous vitriolic treatise against, a diatribe even, against bemoaning the vice of medieval sodomy. And it's called De Planctu Naturae. Why has this been such a profound influence on my life? I'm a devout humanist. I'm of the opinion, live and let live. I am a fervent adherent of that uh, of Terence's famous maxim, I'm a human being and I consider nothing human alien to me. So to combat bigotry, I went back ad fontes. I wanted to read De Planctu Naturae in all its medieval Latin complexity. Um, it's a right riveting read, I can tell you that. But you know what? In it, he bemoans uh, 
nature and, and God's, the, the way that man's uh, vice of homosexuality, it's, he construes it as a vice, has distanced, has, has defiled nature and has distanced man from God. A lot of the debates yesterday were about the notions of gay marriage and notions about gay equality. If you want to understand the fact that these are perennial debates, go back to Alan of Lille. That's right, the day planctu naturae, you heard it here first. So, that's number three. At number four, we have none other than Giovanni Boccaccio. Of course, the author of the Decameron. I love that title. Deca Hameron. What is it? It's a collection of a hundred tales, told over ten days, based in Florence in the year of our Lord, 1348, when the frame story, ten protagonists, uh, three men and seven women, meet in the church of Santa Maria Novella to escape the plague, and then they go out into the hills of Florence, outside of Florence, and they tell stories. They tell stories um, ostensibly as a distraction from the plague. But since I've been introduced as a hip-hop intellectual, I thought I would throw something at you. What's Boccaccio about? Okay, for me, the Decameron. Many have cited him as the father of the modern novel. For me, he fulfills that wonderful Horatian maxim, to instruct and to delight. Or, as the famous South Bronx rapper KRS-One once talked about, edutainment. <laughs> Boccaccio gives us the human comedy. It's the perfect antidote, it's perfectly juxtaposed to Dante's po-faced gravitas, the divine comedy. What is the Decameron for me all about? It's about ingenio, it's about intelligence, it's about wit, and it's about fortuna. And it's about the way that man navigates this environment, this moral landscape, and this intellectual landscape. It's a mercantile classic. And if any of you are thinking at the back of the room, hang on a minute, isn't Boccaccio a bit of a proto-Renaissance man? What are you doing talking about him in a debate on medieval uh, studies in the medieval period? Very famous tome was published, oh, I think in about the 70s, Boccaccio Medievale, by the Italian scholar Vittore Branca. Boccaccio is a man dyed in the wool in the medieval period. The beauty of the Decameron, it's a human comedy. It's not a divine comedy. It is joyously and unashamedly anthropocentric. It's not theocentric. And as we know, Boccaccio was a massive influence on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So there you go, Giovanni Boccaccio, 1311 to about 1373. He's weighing in at number four. Folks, are you ready for number five? Yes. Do I hear a yes? yes? Okay, I'm going to give you none other than Francesco Petrarca, 1304 to 1374. Yes, that's right, the father of Italian humanism, arguably the father of the modern self, and a bequeather to posterity of the beautiful Petrarchan sonnet. Spent most of his life in Avignon and Vaucluse in the south of France. Uh, his father was originally from Florence, but came over to the south of France during the period of the Babylonian captivity when the popes relocated to Avignon. I always see Petrarch as the Teddy Pendergrass, the Marvin Gaye and the Barry White of Italian literature, all rolled into one. Why do I say that? I say that because obviously he immortalized um, exquisitely expressed lyrical and amorous sentiments to his beloved Laura in his sonnets. He's bequeathed to us the Petrarchan form. Also, he was a great book hunter. So much of the Renaissance spirit that was interpreted by people like Poggio Bracciolini starts with Petrarch. In 1333, he famously discovered Cicero's Proarchia that wonderful treatise in defense of poetry in a monastery in Liege. Not only is he a great book hunter and somebody who was imbued with a great notion of the past and, and, and classical antiquity, he's also often heralded as the father of the modern self. Famously in a letter, he ascended Mont Ventoux and he wrote about his feelings. That letter is often heralded as the start of, of the modern self and depictions of the modern self. So we've talked about the lyrical poems, we've talked about the book hunting, we've talked about the modern self. My final thing, I know I've got to end now, my final thing, why do I think Petrarch above all others is the definitive medieval author who's had the most impact upon my own life. Gentlemen in the audience, please put your hands up if in the course of your life you've ever had recourse to use a chat up line. Come on, there's no shame in it. Come on, put your hands up. Be honest. 
Ladies, I would like to humbly share with you, in my opinion, what is the greatest chat-up line in the history of world literature. I'm not making this up. It comes from the Rerum Vulgarium Fragmenta, or the Canzonieri, poem number 22. And in it, Petrarch says, and, and I have to add, guys, if you're thinking of using this line, it's a wonderful boast. Often imitated, never better, but if you're going to use it, make sure you can fulfil the boast. And Petrarch says, when addressing Laura, Solo una notte, e mai non fosse l'alba. Forgive my pronunciation, my medieval Italian is not what it should be. But translated, Petrarch says, Give me one night, and may the dawn never come. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think that now brings matter to, matters to me. Um, it's a difficult act to follow, I think. Um, indeed, many difficult acts to follow. But what I guess I'm trying to convey to you today here are two things, I think, really. One is I'd like to bring together some of the strands of what we've already been hearing about. But two, and perhaps in the more concrete sense, when I was reflecting on what I want to say to you all, is, is why do I bother getting up in the morning, ultimately? Why am I here on a Sunday morning doing this? Why would someone seemingly waste their life, as many might see it, on, on the Middle Ages? And I don't think I can provide definitive answers to you, and, and I wouldn't claim to have all of those answers. But I think it's useful to occasionally reflect on this, and I think there, there are good reasons why people do do so. Um, whether or not I managed to convince you about why I do so is perhaps a different issue altogether. But I'd like to think I can get some way towards doing that. And when I ultimately think, in terms of the, the big issues and the big questions of why, why does one look at this kind of material, why does one care about the Middle Ages, medieval history and literature, I think, to me, perhaps the most concrete thing in terms of that is, is the legacy. And we've already been getting this in elements of what we've been hearing already today, through literature, through history, and what not else. But to me, in particular, what I'd like to emphasize is the legacy in terms of what we are in modern Western Europe in that, in that respect, that ultimately the making of Europe um, and what we consider modern Western civilization is really very much a product of the Middle Ages. So you look around at about 500 AD, um, or indeed even before that in the Roman Empire, you do not see something that looks familiar to us, politically, socially, and otherwise. By about 1500, indeed probably by already about 1300, you do. There is this period of dynamic change, and thereafter, that sets the paradigms for many of the biggest issues um, that we consider, continue to discuss to this day. Not all, of course. That will never be the case. But it does in very fundamental fashions. And I think in this respect, what I'd like to consider my task today is less perhaps illuminating Middle Ages in the sense of trying to make ideas of a dark age become a light age. I, I don't think valuing Middle Ages needs, means we need to chuck out the Renaissance. I think it's merely a matter of appreciating that there is this kind of deep, important legacy. And as all legacies are, it's a mixed legacy. Of course, and we can discuss that as well. But it is one that we cannot get around, and indeed is best not got around. It's best discussed, I think. So to illustrate this, I've basically just chosen three core points, though one, one, one could pick many, many more, that I think um, nicely sum this up to me. First is the Bible and Christianity. Now, this may sound odd in the modern secular age, doubly so for anyone here who actually knows me and realizes, knows that I'm an agnostic raised by atheists, but I think that there's no getting around the legacy of the Bible and of Christianity for our modern society. You cannot really understand it till you've grappled with that. Something that I actually realized when I finally you know, sat down and actually decided to read through the Bible front to back a couple of years ago. The, the, the motifs, the, the depth of material in there that constantly influences us in our daily lives is, is, is really profound. And when you're thinking of great literature, so much has been inspired by the Bible. Think of things like Milton's Paradise Lost, arguably the best English poem ever written. Things like that, we wouldn't have those if it weren't for the fact that European society became deeply Christianized, and that only happened in the Middle Ages. But even indirectly, modern literature, even by people who are not Christian, is still influenced by it, or by people who are not overtly writing Christian literature. Um, I don't think one could imagine Tolkien's um, descriptions of Mordor without imagining fire and brimstone and, um, and biblical images of the apocalypse. So it, it, it just is the language we use, even if we're not aware of it all the time. Second one, and this is perhaps a bit more what I actually do in terms of perhaps in terms of my day job and actually my own research, but I, th I think it's also really worth emphasizing here, and it's modern representative political bodies. We take these for granted. Parliament, 
good thing, of course. Always there, wasn't it? Uh, democracy, gift from ancient Greece. Uh, no, quite simply. Ideologically, yes, that is a legacy and that, that, that did influence evolution modern democracy. But in terms of concrete things, the modern democratic representative systems we have across Europe, not just in England, also in France, Germany, elsewhere, Italy, evolved from the Middle Ages. And it's then only later that uh, the, 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 the legacy of Greece is, is brought into that to justify their evolution further. But the idea that the power of an autocrat or other is wise should be very concretely and very constitutionally defined is something that's worked out in the Middle Ages and that continues to be worked out thereafter. But it starts there, at least the continuous history. As I say, this doesn't necessarily mean writing out earlier ideas, but if we're looking for why do we have a parliament, we have to look to the Middle Ages before we look anywhere else in a meaningful fashion. And then finally, um, and I think this will actually chime in with a few things we've uh, already been hearing here today, my final example is something that I think we're presently renegotiating, um, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, but uh, that's marriage. Basically, our conceptions of marriage have remained largely unchanged from about the 13th century till about now, or at least the last number of years. Now, regardless of what one thinks, whether or not they should change, it's important to realize the very paradigms in which we're expressing our thought, arguing this, are ones that are set by medieval law, in particular medieval church canon law, um, that there is, a, there is a huge and important development of what marriage means um, between about the 9th and 13th centuries. And there's huge change in the Middle Ages about this. In the early Middle Ages, marriage is something very distinctly different than the 15th century. But thereafter, it is fundamentally what we now understand. And much as we now, may now see it as expedient and indeed apropos to change this, we don't understand what we're debating without appreciating that. And I, I, I think really in terms of that, that, you know, this is a concrete thing that we all just take for granted. You know, I'm sure many people in this audience are married and many the, who are not intend to be at some point in their lives. This is a medieval institution and not simply in a dark ages bad thing. It simply is. And I think that's what I'd actually like to, to leave with because I think something like that allows us to appreciate this multifaceted legacy. I don't think Middle Ages are a good thing in a classic good thing, bad thing way. I think to live there would have been in many ways, you know, a, a, a nasty period without modern dentistry. On the other hand, I think that it's a fascinating period. And if we want to understand who we are and what we're doing now, we have to take it seriously. Thank you. I think it's very important to hear from our audience. So if anyone wants to start us off with any kind of comments. In the context of the uh, pre-Raphaelite um, Victorian avant-garde exhibition at Tate Britain at the moment, what did the uh, Victorian avant-garde see as, the, as progressive in the Arthurian romantic traditions that they made a great deal of vi visually. I'm interested in, on the one level, the adoption of kind of medieval, middle age imagery and ideas and so on in pop culture and particularly in kind of music of the 70s, um, you know, Led Zeppelin and, you know, a lot of bands that followed them and also perhaps as the previous speaker said in the Victorian era with people like William Morris, perhaps Ruskin and so on, you know, what were they reacting to when they, you know, went back to sort of medieval guilds and, you know, the idea of craft and so on. Slightly crude Marxist question is, you know, actually what was happening in economic society at the time uh, and how did that prefigure the modern day? You can look back to early, and we talked a little bit about mercantilism, uh, uh, you know, as a sort of prefiguring capitalism and a division of labor, um, the role of the monarch in society being usurped by the aristocracy and then by the kind of early bourgeoisie, and how did that shape the period as well? I am interested in the thing you were saying that the Middle Ages do make modern man in a sense, and I mean, I guess I'm, I'm less interested in the economic side, but I'm quite interested in the, the ideas side, and, and because on one level you feel there's this sort of homogeneity around med medieval society, as you say, the, you know, the, the link of the, the church and, and the way it organises society and you're not separate from the church. But I, I'm really interested in what you're saying about marriage and the formation of marriage. You, know, you feel there's something about ideas as well and perhaps the, the, that is not you know, quite as rigid and as formal as, 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 as I guess, contemporarily, that's what you think about middle-aged man, but, but it does sound like there's something that's moving in ideas or a way of people conceiving themselves. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the popularisation of religious thought. From what I've read, and there's not, not very little, of uh, the ordinary people's understanding of religion in the medieval period, 
obviously there's, you know, there's not much in terms of source material to go on, but obviously it would have been very limited and very confused understanding based upon largely you know, pictorial representations of the Bible on the, on the, church, on the church walls. So, and it's you know, very vague, whereas obviously with the, with the Reformation represented a kind of democratization of that, of that knowledge, for want of a better word. So I'm kind of interested in, in your views on, on that, whether that's, a kind of, whether that's accurate or not, or was there more sophisticated understanding of religious ideas? And somebody who hasn't been mentioned, and I'd be interested in, in the panel's thoughts, is Tom Sakinas. I'm currently kind of interested in the early modern period, and, and he kind of shines through, I feel, in, in Locke, for example. But again, there seems to be this separation kind of almost like kind of parcelization of knowledge, this idea that there's the medieval over here and then there's the Renaissance there and the early modern there, whereas even if the, un- even if the understanding of it has changed, the kind of the intellectual history seems to, uh, seems to bear out the idea that there's you know, this kind of very strong survival. I think the, these are all interesting um, and, and very good points made. Um, the two ones I perhaps pick up on most immediately um, I think the Henry VIII one's a good point. Perhaps someone else will come back to that one. Um, I think in general the impact is, of course, massive um, and difficult to sort of say, respond to in a pity fashion, but there's no doubt um, about that, and the, the one could have a whole debate about that one. But the two things I'd like to just immediately pick up on in terms of this are, one, the economic change. Um, now, mercantilism and things like that in late Middle Ages is, is a huge issue into the early modern period, certainly very important. It's been argued, to my mind, very, very persuasively, however, that the biggest economic change we have before the Industrial Revolution is what is considered classically the the, the feudal revolution, which probably took longer than we thought, probably wasn't as fundamental as we thought. But ultimately, between about 800 and about 1200, you move from a society in which raiding and war basically pays money, you can, cattle raiding makes you money, to one in which war costs, because you're actually gaining enough money off of your agriculture that any kind of expenditure, anything that takes men off the field is actually losing you money. So that, that's fundamental. That's going back to a political system much more like what you saw in, in ancient um, Rome. So that is a fundamental shift, and it never goes back in terms of that. You know, it, it, Whether or not one considers this progress, if you were a peasant, it certainly wasn't. It meant harder working, but it was there was no going back. So there, there is that fundamental change that before the Industrial Revolution is probably the greatest single one. And that, that certainly is a medieval change. Um, and I think that that is an important aspect that we perhaps downplay, but there is huge economic change in that respect. And the other one is in terms of ideas, in terms of perhaps Aquinas, um, someone else who might bandy around um, is Peter Abelard. Again, ultimately, if you read some early medieval thinkers, with the exception perhaps of some like Boethius, they do seem very weird and different and wacky. Um, great, I love it, but they don't strike us as you know, very modern speaking to us. You, you read from about the 12th century onwards, and suddenly they do, in many respects. There are people at universities, many of which still exist, writing things that we can follow on from. If I could just uh, pick up on a couple of uh, points. One of the reasons that I am fascinated by the medieval period, I think it was John of Salisbury who first coined the wonderful little term we are, uh, I think it was pygmies standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think that explains so much of the bridge between classical, medieval, renaissance and modern culture. So I think that's something very important to bear in mind. John of Salisbury said that first. Another thing, another important strand that I always try and bear in mind when thinking about the medieval period. On the one hand, it is fervently theocentric. Life for the majority of the population in those times, nasty, brutish, and short. We've got these wonderful cathedrals, Chartres, Orvieto, Florence, and yet there we don't know who designed them. It was for the greater glory of God, not for, not for man. Yet at the same time in the period, whether it's in the Carmina Burana, whether it's in uh, the Decameron, whether it's in some of Petrarch's sonnets, Il uh, conoscer chiaramente che quanto piace al mondo è breve sogno, this a wonderful awareness of life's transience and the ephemerality. So mortality on the one hand, and yet at the same time, a very, very theocentric society. And just finally to conclude, for me as a devout humanist, one of the things I love about the period, which is beautifully formulated and articulated in arguably the most quintessential medieval voice, is obviously Dante Alighieri in La Divina Commedia. Love is the animating principle of the universe. And whether you take that to be a Pauline notion or whether you take that to be a classical notion, whether that is amor per se or amor praetise, for me, that Dantean notion of love animating the universe 
imbues the whole period, intellectually as well as socially. We would be absolutely delighted to talk with all of you down maybe on the ground floor coffee point about the Middle Ages, about the pre-Raphaelites, about identity and about the awesomeness of prog rock. Uh, <laughs> so we've run over and that's very, very sad, but please come and talk to us at the coffee point. Yeah. We'd be delighted to continue this.